to uh, our message this morning, since we have the kids in the other room, we're starting that. We're going to uh, now not do a children's sermon second hour to encourage our kids as we continue to see folks back to be in children's ministry. That way we can sort of spread our numbers out around the building a little bit better. So we're going to get right into our sermon this morning. You might want to get your uh, place set in the Bible. We're going to be in Romans chapter 10. Uh, But we're going to talk about evangelism this morning, about telling people about Jesus. And for everybody here this morning, evangelism's important. There's two reasons that I can think of that evangelism is important for each of us. First one is this. You are here this morning because somebody made evangelism important. At some point, somebody decided to share Jesus with you. It might have been a parent, it may have been a co-worker, it may have been a sibling, who knows. But all of you are the product at some level of somebody taking seriously the Great Commission. Now, the second reason I think evangelism is important is this. All of us know somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Uh, and, And we all should know people that don't know Jesus. But we also should have a heart for those people. If you don't like either of those two uh, reasons that evangelism is important, consider maybe this. God himself loves unsaved people, and we are his plan for sharing the good news. The church of Christ is his plan for telling people about him. Uh, So talking to people about Jesus should be a priority. Now, Christians have not always done well with evangelism. Sometimes we have sent uh, some mixed messages. uh, This here I thought was a bit of a mixed message. Uh, Turner Byrne, Happy New Year. A little bit of a mixed message there on evangelism. And I can think of other, you know, uh, throughout church history, some examples of bad evangelism. The Crusades would have been an example of bad evangelism, right? Right that we thought we could share the good news of Jesus Christ through the tip of a spear, through uh, warfare. Uh, did not work super well. Uh, but it's, it, it can be other things that are bad examples of evangelism. I can think back 20 years ago when I'm, actually a little longer uh, ago than that, when I'm a youth pastor in Tillamook, Oregon, I had a group of people down on the Oregon coast, young people, were walking into a store and there are some, I, I don't even know, street evangelists, but they seem more like gospel protesters to me than street evangelists, and they had the actually Turner Burn signs and uh, some super angry signs telling people they were going to hell, and they were yelling at my kids as we went into a store that they needed to turn or burn. Many of them had, you know, my kids were followers of Jesus, but I always encourage my, my youth group kids to bring their friends, and so there were some, and when we got back to our retreat center, I had a couple of kids go, so are those folks like you? Are you guys like with them? And I had to say, no, you know, um, that's not how we do things. And I had to sort of differentiate. There's been some great examples of evangelism over the years. How many of you have heard of Bill Bright? How many of you have ever heard the name Bill Bright? Bill Bright's a pretty famous name. How many of you have ever heard the name Campus Crusade for Christ? Okay, lots more hands went up. Bill Bright in 1951 started the Campus Crusade for Christ at UCLA. And Bill Bright was one of the great evangelists of the 20th century. Uh, And he created a little trap that became very, very famous. How many of you have ever heard of the four spiritual laws? Have you ever heard that phrase? Bill Bright is the one that sort of popularized that. And he had a little uh, um, pamphlet created, a little, uh, um, uh, what do we call them? Um, a little tract, yeah, he, he had a little tract created to hand out to, to, to college students. And it had what he called the four spiritual laws. And I'll just read them as they were originally written. Four spiritual laws is this. God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. Number two, man is sinful and separated from God, therefore he cannot know and experience God's love and plan for his life. The third one is Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Through him you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. And then the final one is this. We must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Then we can know and experience God's plan for your life, for our lives. And uh, the the thing was they encouraged uh, the leadership of Campus Crusade for Christ to take these around and share these four spiritual laws with young people. And, and point out sort of a need for Jesus. And this actually turned out to be a very effective tool. And at the end of most of these tracks, there was a little prayer you could pray with folks, uh, a prayer of repentance. And so that was the advent of the four 
spiritual laws that really led to an evangelism boom. Uh, I was actually trained to use the four spiritual laws in a college group I sang in, in the 1980s. Wow. I was in college in the 1980s. That's a long time ago. Uh, but we were, we were encouraged to use this. We did prison ministry and some other things. And you know what? It was a pretty effective tool at the time. Now, this series is called, Is That Really In There? And today we're going to talk about the four spiritual laws. So the question is, is the four spiritual laws, are the four spiritual laws in the Bible? And here's how I'd answer that question. You will nowhere in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, find the phrase four spiritual laws. Okay, that's a human construct. But I would argue uh, that the four spiritual laws are true. What Bright wrote is essentially a truthful thing. And it was effective. And, and this kind of tool of evangelism, telling people the four spiritual laws, may still have some effectiveness left in it. But I would argue for the most part, it's only going to be effective with people probably late 40s, early 50s, and older as a general rule. So this morning, I'm going to argue that while this is true, we need to start thinking of evangelism in some, some new ways as a kingdom people. Um, and we, we need to... Um, Consider what was done in the past that was good and integrate it into the new. And I would say this. Bill Bright had an incredible passion in his life for unsaved people, for pre-Christian people, for people that didn't know about Jesus. In fact, Bill Bright one time said that there's no higher calling or greater privilege known to man than being involved in helping fulfill the Great Commission. For Bill Bright, sharing Jesus was like breathing. And I would say that as the church, and not just the Wenatchee church, I'm talking about churches in America, I think we've lost, anybody agree with me that maybe we've lost a little of our passion for evangelism, for telling people about Jesus? I'm concerned about this, and I think that we need to reignite that passion. And I would say 2020 is an outstanding year to do this. That we are seeing people right now that are frightened, that are uh, worried uh, because of a pandemic, because of a, an election season, which is crazy. Uh, throw on top of it now in the West Coast, mammoth fires and kind of breath-choking smoke. And people are saying, you know what, what I've normally gleaned my happiness from, what I normally put my confidence in, these things are failing. But as God's kings and people, we're following something that is not failing, has not failed, and will never fail. And so I think that in the environment we're in right now, a lot of people see these as really dark times. I see them as tremendously hopeful times for the church because we can come into the world with an encouraging message for people that points them to something that cannot be shaken. So we need to reignite our passion. Now, what are? let me ask, I'm going to throw this out. We're starting to get more people back. We're a little down today because of the smoke, but I want this to be a little interactive this morning. What are some reasons people don't want to share Jesus? What are some reasons we, we are afraid to tell people about Jesus? Apparently the masks are muffling because I can't hear anybody right now. Anybody? What are some reasons we don't want to tell people about Jesus? Fear. Fear, yeah. And there's all sorts of reasons we might have fear. Rejection. You know, what if they laugh at us? What if, we, what if we're outnumbered? What's another reason we don't want to do it? Courage. Courage, yeah. That, 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 that sort of the reverse side of, of fear, we just don't have that courage to do it. What are some of the other things maybe we're afraid of that might happen if we're trying to share the gospel with something? Somebody. Yeah, that, that there's a hostility towards, well, Christianity right now. So you might get pushback on that. You know what another common one is? Maybe I, f I find it like, I think it might be the most common. I don't think there's any empirical data, but I sense it anecdotally when I talk to people. I think we're afraid of not saying the right thing or not knowing what to say. Or people will say, I'll have people go, boy, I don't even know enough of the Bible to talk to people about Jesus. And I think those are all sort of valid reasons, but we need to tell people. And I think all of us are capable. Uh, we're going to look at the words of Paul this morning in Romans 10, starting in verse 10. Uh, 
Uh, we got Ryan. Ryan's going to come up right now. Ryan Rainbow. He's going to read our passage of Scripture. Out of respect for God's Word, why don't we stand as Ryan brings the, 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 the Word this morning. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord who has believed our message, consequently faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Thank you, Ryan. God bless you. You may be seated. So let's talk about some uh, ideas surrounding the concept of evangelism. And I'm going to give you some, uh, maybe some new ideas this morning. In fact, I'll tell you this this morning. I have five points this morning. If you fall asleep for the first three, that's okay. You'll know a lot of this stuff. But the last two I really want you to pick up on. First three are important too, but the last two I think really speak to where we're at, particularly with our young folks right now. So let's talk about this. First off, new evangelism is missional and not attractional. New evangelism is missional and not attractional. What do I mean by that? We're not going to have a lot of success getting people to come to us. So we need to go to them, period. All right? Much of what was done in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in the church was uh, attractional evangelism. We would do cantatas and musical productions to try to get people into our building, right? And the, the purpose was evangelism. Many of you have heard of Willow Creek Church outside of Chicago that really uh, pioneered the seeker-sensitive church. And Bill, uh, Bill Heibel's idea there at that church was you provided the most uh, uh, unchurch-friendly environment with the best music, uh, the best production values, uh, so that people would want to come back. And the challenge we found out with that type of ministry was when you uh, do a show, you create an audience rather than creating a community. And so we see a lot of movement now away from the seeker-sensitive how many of you grew up in a church where you had to invite your friends to church Sunday? Anybody? Invite you? And there was like prizes. If you brought the most friends, you could win something, right? And so we used to do that. And I think those had their place and maybe still have their place in some, in some quarters. But there's some challenges with that. That's all missional. And the church and Christianity in particular, we have a messaging problem, right? And there's a lot of people who were hurt in the church. So the concept of stepping into a church is a frightening thing. So like Paul says, we need to go. We need to go to them. Uh, I remember in the uh, 90s, I was working at a TV station in Yakima. And Ida and I were heading, attending a, a church there. And we had a gymnasium. And we had kind of a pickup basketball game on one of the nights of the week. And we were encouraged to bring our, uh, our friends to come play just so they'd get to know some of the guys at the church. And uh, I remember I brought a guy from the TV station I worked at, and, and one of the first nights I brought him, one of the guys at the church just kind of laid into him with a sales pitch about Christianity. And as we were leaving, the guy from my work said, did you invite me to, did you invite me to play basketball so I'd come to your church? And, you know, my answer was, well, yeah, um, was the truth. But he wound up feeling a little bit more like a project and didn't want to show up anymore. Um, so this attractional model is going to be a problem now. We need to go out to people. I like what Paul says here in Romans 10. In verse 14, he says, How can they call on the one who have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one who they've not heard? And how can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are said? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. We have to be sent. The good news travels on feet, and we need to find ways to go into our communities. Now, here's the good news. 
We're already in our communities, in our workplaces, in our hospitals, in our coffee shops, in our schools. And so for most of us, it's just a matter of how, getting to, to start, starting to see talking about Jesus as a natural extension of who we are, right? So next we need to listen to and take time with people. That's our second point. We need to listen to and take time with people. Uh, many of us are familiar with the story of Zacchaeus. Uh, and let me read it to you quickly. It's in uh, Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Um, ha, ha, you guys remember Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, right? And a wee little man was he, all right? Hey, Janice, we're on number two there. And here we go. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was short, so he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed on a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay, catch that word, stay, at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And I have, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. There's a sort of a Zacchaeus model going on here. First off, you have to understand Zacchaeus was a tax collector, but he wasn't like an IRS agent. Uh, what, what that means when you say a tax collector in Roman times would have been that Zacchaeus was in all likelihood a Jewish national who was on the take for the Romans. He collected taxes from his Roman or from his Jewish brothers and sisters, but he gleaned off the top. He essentially was a thief that collected money for Rome but kept money. And so he was seen in low regard by his Jewish brothers and sisters. And here you have Jesus walking through a crowd of people in Jericho. And what does Jesus say to him? It's, Jesus has a sort of funky, I mean, he doesn't get attracted out, and he doesn't tell him, he says, I'm going to come spend some time with you at your house. He actually uses the word stay. I'm going to come stay at your house today. He seeks out Zacchaeus. He says he's coming to his house. And what happens? I think we don't see all of the story here, because I think in the context of these four paragraphs, Jesus moved, or Zacchaeus moves from the tree to his home. We get some indication. But Jesus went to be with Zacchaeus and spend some time with him. It was about relationship. I think it's fascinating. Jesus didn't say, come down from here. I, I want to tell you about me and what I'm doing and what you need to do. What was his first words? He goes, I'm going to come stay at your house today. I'm going to come spend some time with you. It's been pointed out by a lot of really smart people over the years that most of Jesus' ministry happened in two places, people's homes and in the marketplace. I think we need to learn from that, that we continue to be a people who need to get into people's homes and into the marketplace to, shout, to talk about Jesus. When we do that, we learn people's stories. Jesus, having God knowledge, knew people's stories. He didn't need to know, go to Zacchaeus' house to know about Zacchaeus. But for the Zacchaeuses in our life, we need to take time to get to know them. We need to get to know their backgrounds. We need to get to know their brokenness and their hurts, their family histories, their priorities, what they do for work. I think one of the important things that we all need to learn about people is their religious history. We have a tremendous number of people in the world today who were wounded in a legalistic church setting and are very reluctant to have anything to do with the church. And so by learning that and learning about folks, we can start to talk to them about Jesus in a way that is not threatening. But the only way that happens is if we get to know them first. A lot of us operate with assumptions about people. I, I'm, I'm telling people more and more that in evangelism in 2020, we need to assume that whoever we're talking to knows absolutely nothing about God. Nothing. That was an assumption we didn't need to make 40 years ago. 40 years ago, most people knew something about the Bible and the Christian God. But not anymore. So that's why listening becomes so important. We can't make assumptions about what people know. Now next, 
Not only is their story important, but you know who else's story is important? Your own. Your story is important. Recognize the importance of your story. Um, I always tell people this. People go, I, I don't know what to say. When I was working with teenagers on evangelism, I always said, if you don't know what to say, tell them your own story. In fact, for years I had kids, I stole this from somebody, I forget who I stole it from, but I had kids write out their testimony, and I called it the second greatest story ever told. Because the first greatest story is the Jesus narrative, Jesus story. But everybody has their own Jesus story as well. There's this great story in the book of uh, John and the Gospel of John. There's this, there's this guy that's been was blind from birth, okay? And Jesus heals him. And he can see now. And the people in the town are amazed by this because they recognize this guy as being the blind guy that was begging his whole life. And they go, look, he can see now. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, the, the churchmen of the day, are really upset that this guy has been healed. You know why they're upset? And they're upset with Jesus. You know why they're upset with Jesus for healing? Anybody remember? It was on the Sabbath. It was, it was on a day where the, the Pharisaical law would have said, you cannot work. And they would have said, you can't heal. You're not allowed to heal. Don't heal on the Sabbath. So they're grilling this formerly blind guy, and they're saying, who was this person that healed you? Is he a sinner? And I love what the blind man says in John 9, 25. It's something that all of us could say. The blind guy says, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And I think all of us have a I was blind, but now I see story. Our pre-Jesus story. Maybe for some of us that story is ongoing. I think it's okay for people to see that we're not perfect. Then we can say, well, here's how Jesus has been working in my life. And here's some things that I'm learning. I was once blind, but now I see. I was once addicted to drugs, but now I'm clean. I was once coming out of a broken marriage, but God has made me whole. Stories are powerful. By the way, young people love stories. My kids even still love it when I tell them stories from when I was younger. People need to hear our stories. Stories are powerful. And your story is a story of God's grace. So don't be shy in telling it. And here's the great thing about your story. Nobody can really dispute it, right? There's all sorts of things people can push back on you on, but if you tell them your story, it's really hard to push back on your story. Because it's your story. You know it better than anyone. In, in some ways, it's almost unimpeachable. So I encourage people to tell their story. Now, everybody wake up. These last two points are, 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 big, are big deal, okay? Everybody pay attention here. Particularly for young people, when talking to them about important issues, identity is a big deal. Identity is a huge, huge deal. Um, and this would be an area where maybe the four spiritual laws and that kind of presentation don't work. The old model of evangelism, if you look back at Bill Bright's four spiritual laws, spiritual law number two is this. You're sinful and separated from God. Why might a young person, let's say a millennial on down through Gen Y, Gen Z, why would a young person maybe struggle with all people are sinful? If you started out with your presentation of talking about Jesus going, we're all sinners, you're a sinner. What would, why, why do you think that might be problematic in talking to young people? Good, good, yes. Others? It's a real simple one, too. One is that they don't see sin. A lot of people, folks don't see sin like we see sin. In fact, some people's sin is their identity. So what about guilt? What role does guilt play? How do you think young people respond to guilt? There's a lot of pushback against guilt. You know, don't bring, you know, it's, it's shame. We have the, the term shaming, and, and shaming is always bad, right? Well, they would associate that with that. So a lot of young people, first off, they're not going to agree on a definition of sin for a lot of them, particularly those who have had no exposure to sort of traditional Judeo-Christian values. But number two, when you talk to them about guilt, 
you're shaming. And so shaming can be a real problem for them. They can perceive it that way. And we've seen this huge change over the years in what people consider as important. For my generation and older, if you'd ask people to say, you know, what is life's meaning? Um, what are you supposed to be doing in life? What's, what's the purpose of life? You know what, you know, 40, 50 years ago, you may have heard people say, well, the meaning of life is to be a good person, to do good. Somewhere in the 70s and 80s, a lot of people that work in missions say there was this, this huge shift that happened, okay? And the meaning of life, it was no longer, you know, be a good citizen and do right. The worldview transitioned to this idea of being true to yourself. Does that resonate? I mean, do we recognize that in our society, that there's this idea, and it shifted. Tim Keller writes about this quite a bit, that at some point along the way, we shifted to, you need to be true to yourself. Well, in the last, since the advent of social media, we've seen that modified even once more. And I was, I was listening to Keller, and he would argue now that if, if you were to talk to a millennial or younger on what is the meaning of life, they would put it, instead of being true to yourself, they would maybe say something more along the lines of, you need to discover and express your true identity. The purpose of life is to go out and, and, and discover and express your true identity. And, and it's not about finding your identity so much as we can create our identity. Okay? So if you question that, here's what I would tell you to do. I would tell you to look at anyone's social media page. People craft an identity on social media. And uh, they want to make them, and, and think about it. Uh, we, you know, we've talked about selfies before. There's, there's so much that can be gleaned from a person's selfie. When a person takes a picture of themselves, almost always they're trying to communicate something about their identity. Uh, especially if they post it. So what are some identities that we're finding in the world? What are some things in the world right now that people base their identity on? Political, and political would be one. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but sometimes people post political things on social media. Has anybody noticed that lately? I don't know. Anybody? Come on, folks. Uh, so political identity. What are other identities? What was that? Race and ethnicity, very good. Race is a huge identity right now. And by the way, we're learning that, that people can actually, I gotta be careful what I say here, but race is not necessarily what we think it is in terms of identity. People identify sometimes regardless of, of, of how they were born or how they were raised. That, they, that, that identity becomes more powerful or change as they grow over. What, what are some other identities we have right now? Sexual identity. Sexual identity. What else? Jobs. Career. Career is a huge one for a lot of people. What else? I, I wrote some down, and again, I had time, a little more time to think about it. I put you on the spot. But sports is a lot of folks' identity. Um, body art is an identity. Self-expression through body art. Uh, and along the same lines, fitness and leisure. Um, but those were all good ones there. But here is the problem. Identity becomes what we live for. And whatever we live for enslaves us. 100% of the time. Whatever we live for will enslave us. And identity can be problematic because identity is always performative. Okay. What do I mean by that? If you're expressing yourself through a particular identity, let's pick one. Let's say uh, through your work, through your career. If work is your identity, you're always going to have to be producing more. If you have a down quarter, your identity is damaged, right? When I was early on in ministry, my identity was being a pastor. And by the way, if your identity is being a pastor, people go, well, that's a good identity. If it is your core identity, it's a sin, too. Because here was what I learned. I, I, I was working as hard as I could to be a good pastor, but there was always a pastor better than me. And I never quite felt like I measured up. These kind of identities, when we talk about 
self-creating and then fulfilling identities are always performative. Whatever we live for enslaves us, and we will always, 100% of the time, feel inadequate. There's actually some research being done right now on, on this sort of identity and how it relates to social media and depression and suicide among our younger folks. Now here is the good news, and this is where evangelism comes in. All of these identities that you all just listed are achieved identities, okay? That in other words, we work towards presenting them and increasing them in our lives. Christianity is not an identity that is achieved. Tim Keller says Christianity is received, not achieved. We don't have to work to be followers of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. The, the word picture the Bible actually uses is that we've been clothed with Christ. And so talking about identity with young people can be a valuable place to learn and listen uh, to, to them. Because one of the things you may find over time is they are not gleaning the satisfaction from their identity that they hoped they would have. It continues to come up short, and it's leaving uh, an emptiness in their lives. The world's identities enslave. By the way, a lot of these things aren't bad that we mentioned. They're not inherently bad things. But if they become our identity and the core of who they are, any identity apart from Christ will always fall short. So as Christians, when we talk to folks, finding out how, what their identity is, where they find their identity, will really help us in talking to them about the gospel. Now, the important thing here is that we're not condescending. You know, oh, I see you've covered your body in tattoos. You're an idiot. That's not a good, you know, gospel message, right? That we need to take time to listen. And we all recognize that this Christ identity is a good identity because, because there's a big difference between the Christ and a couple big differences between the world's identities and the Christ identities. If I fail in business, I might lose my job. If my identity is, you know, my marketing job at the advertising firm and I'm just not good at it, when I get fired, my identity is crushed and I'm left wondering who I am. But if my identity is in Christ, here's the beauty of Christ identity. If I screw up, Christ still loves me. Christ is still willing to bring me back and work to recover me. And that's liberating and reassuring to a lot of people who are working awfully hard to create an identity that they can never live up to. Another problem with identity, especially if you look at social media, a lot of times if you look at their identity on social media and then you look at who they really are, they know it's falling short. And then there's a third problem with identity. World's identities are exclusionary, okay? If your identity is based on a certain view of race or politics, you are naturally going to exclude people that disagree from you. But Jesus' identity is not an identity that is exclusionary. Jesus offers this to everyone as a gift. Again, received, not achieved. Nobody is on the outside if they come to Christ. And so I think, you know, we need to listen, like I said, kind of going back to the Zacchaeus point, we need to be willing to spend time and listen to people and, and see what their identity is and ask some questions about their identity. And, and I think it's okay to say, well, how are you doing in this area? Is it, is it bringing you satisfaction? Do you feel, you know, where do you feel empty? And, and then pointing them towards a different way. Now, there's a final thing that I think is, is really helpful when thinking about young people and evangelism. For younger people, life and good works are deeply connected. You know, the problem, one of the problems I saw with evangelism in the 80s and 90s when I was doing it in church, and um, just a problem inherent in it, we gave people these tracks, the four spiritual laws, to share Jesus with somebody, maybe at the end we'd pray the sinner's prayer with them, and then what would happen? What would happen after that, after we got somebody saved? Anybody, what would happen? <laughs> Nothing would happen. Uh, we would check the box, you know, yay, we, we got them in the camp, uh, they're in, Who's, where's the next one, you know? Who can I go to and talk to next? 
The problem with that is, and, and this is something that I like about the current generation, this is something I love about the current generation, is that they don't want to do anything that's not deeply connected to the rest of their life. And the gospel is deeply connected. So when, I, when you talk to young people about getting saved, they want to know what they're being saved for a lot of times. So what, what now? What, what, what does this look like? What am I supposed to do from here? You will hear more of those questions now. This is good news, and it provides a, a huge opportunity. Uh, young people are actually intrigued by Jesus, for the most part. Less excited about the church, but intrigued about Jesus. There's a natural curiosity. Uh, Jesus was really concerned with how we live, wasn't he? And for Jesus, our faith and our engagement with him and our acceptance of him as the, 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 the CEO of our life meant that our lives changed. There's this great word picture that Jesus is giving in Matthew 25. And these righteous people listening to Jesus say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And then the king will reply, truly I tell you, whoever did one of these, of the least of these brothers, whoever, I tell, uh, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of these least of brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus we love Jesus by loving other people and by serving other people. Let me tell you how this played out in ministry for me. Years ago when I take kids on mission trips, they had to fill out an application to go on a mission trip with me. And I made them kind of give me a little written explanation of their, when they were saved and how they were saved. And over the years, and, that was, and completing all of that, they had to do that. Going on the mission trip was contingent on them doing that. So in a sense... Going on a mission trip with the church was contingent on them being saved. Since I've been in Wenatchee, this is a, a, an area of ministry that has changed, and after conversations with other people in ministry, I have decided that in my area, of, in, in the ministry that I'm working in, it is okay for non-Christian people to come alongside and do ministry. I've allowed non-Christian people to go on mission trips. Why? Because I think that that's one area where they see faith made alive and active. Where it connects the salvation story with the sanctification story. The idea that we were saved not just as a ticket to heaven, but we were saved with a purpose to be the hands and feet of Jesus on earth. And I think it's a, tr a tremendous witness for people to get to see Christians acting like Christians. Because here's the reality. Young people are not so interested in what the church says as much as they are interested in what the church does and who the church serves and how the church serves. I want them to see uh, Jesus and Jesus' actions being lived out in the people that call this a church. That's why I even have, you know, it's, we're a little funny right now because we are curtailed, but I've even had people uh, serve in ministry in the church before they were saved. Like, I had somebody ask me if they could be a greeter before they were a Christian. And I'm like thinking, well, that's a happy person that likes to greet. Probably not going to do any harm. And it allows them to come in contact with a lot of believers. I think there's some... I could be wrong. This could all blow up in my face. But I think it's worth a try. Because I think that those who are outside looking in want to know that this faith we believe in leads to some kind of change in us conclusion this morning is this. Evangelism that younger generations will listen to is relational and not transactional. I mentioned earlier, you know, and you, Glenn, you hit it right on the, on the head. You know, we get people saved, we kind of check the box, and then we move on. No one, one of the things I'm learning is that nobody likes to be a project, right? And sometimes we can make evangelism seem like we're making somebody a project. People want to engage in relationship and conversation, and there is no more important relationship than our relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that relationship is healthy, it connects us to one and others. We need to realize that evangelism in 2020 may be a little slower than it's been in the past. 
So we need to re-up our urgency. If it's going to take a little bit more time, we need to work a little harder at it, right? And engaging people and telling them about Jesus. But we need to be ready to do it. I realize, you know, uh, as a 50-something-year-old man, I, I, I can talk about a lot of things super easily. It comes really naturally to me. Like, I can talk about work pretty naturally. I can talk about my hobbies really easily. I am a, a Gene and I can talk about sports for, for hours without, you know, inhaling. We can just go on and on and on, you know, and those things come really naturally. But talking about this good news of Jesus is a bit of a struggle, even for a pastor. You know, you think, boy, am I going to make this feel weird? Am I going to make it, it's going to be uncomfortable, it's going to be awkward. I had this image this week that if we're given good news, about something so transformative, so life-changing, we probably can't help but share it, right? I was thinking back to March 11th, 1998. Uh, in the early morning hours of March 11th, 1998, at Tillamook County General Hospital, um, Emma Kate Malman was born, our youngest. And Anita and I were kind of old school. We never found out what uh, gender our babies were going to be in advance. So we didn't know. But for whatever reason, we both assumed we were just having a boy. And we had boys' names picked out. We hadn't even picked out a girl's name. And, uh, you know, after a, a, an extended labor, Emma was born. And the doctor handed her over to me and said, you have a little girl. And I'm like... I have a little girl. And, uh, you know, you remember when you had your first child, any of your children, your second children, you remember how, wow, this is a thing. Well, after a while, Anita went to sleep. And uh, Emma was in the little crib thing next to the bed there. And so I snuck out. I went to a coffee shop every morning uh, called Muddy Waters in Tillamook. That was my coffee shop in Tillamook, Oregon. And I'd, I'd sit there and work. And it was sort of all the regulars in there when I went in at 6 or 7 in the morning on that morning that Emma was born. And when I, when I walked in there, you know what I talked about that day? What did I talk about? All I could talk about was Emma. I mean, I had just been given this incredible gift of this healthy little girl. I was so excited. When I walked in there, and the guy that owned the place goes, so what's going on today, Mike? Boy, they wish they hadn't asked that question. I was so excited. I talked to her, oh, you got, you got to see, you know, I, you know I, it was amazing. It was life-changing. In some ways, can the gospel be seen as the same sort of thing? That we've been given this exceptionally good news. That for many of us, we've lived life in sort of a broken sort of way. And we know our flaws, and we know our imperfections, and we know our ugliness, but we've also come to terms with the fact that there is this Jesus who loves us dearly. And if he loves us, he'll love other people. We need to reignite our passion for telling people about Jesus. Because I tell you what, folks, has there ever been a year where people need to hear more? And they're probably not, right? I mean, right now, the gospel has to be a go sort of thing, a being sent sort of thing. Because people are... I mean, this morning, you know, we're down this morning, I'm sure, because what well, we did, we had workers this morning call and said, we're not coming in because of the smoke. People are isolated right now. And that's unfortunate, but it also creates an opportunity for us to point them towards a Jesus who can work through any isolation, who can work in any storm, who can be there when people are broken and people are hurting. Not only that, who wants to be there? A Jesus who says, come to me, everybody who is tired and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. A Jesus who says, in this world you have, you will have troubles, but behold, I've come to overcome the world. That's a message that people need to hear in 2020. Let's stand as we close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for bringing us here today. We thank you, God, that the virus in our area seems to be slowing down and there are many less people infected and, and in the hospital, God, and that is a good news thing. I pray today for this smoke, 
that it would also go away, God, that you would uh, see it eliminated from our air, that it would blow out of the West Coast. I pray, God, that these fires would stop and that these firefighters, God, would be safe as they fight these fires. And this morning, God, as we talk about evangelism, as we talk about uh, hearing from you and then sharing what we know from you to others, God, that, that we would, would, would have a reignited passion in our life for telling people about you. That, God, we would be a people who are seeing your kingdom come. We are participating in your kingdom come. And as we close this morning, God, we pray in the way that you taught us to, and we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.